Hi, I recently found this rather colourful motherboard and I thought it gave the perfect opportunity to take a look at multi-phase buck converters. If you've ever had the opportunity to take a look at a modern motherboard, you may have noticed all this stuff going on in the top corner, right next to the CPU socket. This group of components handles power delivery to the CPU, taking the 12 volt from the main computer's power supply and taking it down to around 1 volt for a modern CPU. So let's take a closer look at this section of the motherboard and see what's going on. So here you can clearly see three identical sub-circuits that have been replicated, and these are often referred to as power phases. Each of these sub-circuits is just a simple buck converter. But what actually is a buck converter? Well, this motherboard helpfully has a few non-multi-phase buck converters we can take a look at, like this one over here. So let's take a look at the components making up this single buck converter. Now first off we have these two tall brown cylinders. They are electrolytic capacitors, used to store energy and smooth out voltage ripple. Next we have this green toroid with enamelled copper wire wrapped around it. This is our inductor which again stores energy though this time for smoothing current ripple. And then finally we have these two black devices which are the most important. They are our transistors or more specifically MOSFETs. These are the electronically controlled switches that we can use to change how the circuit is connected. One of the MOSFETs is connected to the positive supply, so in this case 12 volts and it's that one. And the other MOSFET, this lower one, connects to the negative supply, so in this case 0 volts. And the other terminals of both of these MOSFETs are joined together to form a very common configuration known as a half bridge, which allows us to easily switch between two voltages, positive and negative, by turning on the high or low side MOSFET respectively. To try and illustrate this concept a bit more clearly, I've created this, a manual half bridge, using a simple single pole double throw switch. You can see, just like the buck converter, we have a positive and negative supply, the red and the black, and the blue is our output. Flicking the switch will change which of these two wires the blue wire is connected to. As you can see, because when I flick the switch, the multimeter reading goes from 0 volts up to 12 volts, and then when I flick it again, back to 0 volts. But how does this give the 1 volt we need to supply a CPU? It's either on or off. 12 volts is going to fry your CPU instantly, and nothing's going to happen at 0 volts. Well, all we need to do is flick our switch very quickly and then control the amount of time it's on and off. And the ratio between the amount of time it spends on to a total period is the same as the output voltage to the input voltage. For example, if I spend half my time with the switch on and half my time with the switch off, the average is going to be half of the input voltage, so 6 volts. Or if I want my 1 volt for a CPU, then I put it on about 8% of the time, and the rest of the time I'm connected to the negative supply, or 0 volts. As the concept of having the switch on or off is fundamentally digital, I've temporarily replaced our multimeter with an LED, so that turns on when I flip the switch and back off. And hopefully with this LED I can illustrate the difference between a half bridge and a buck converter. Right now this circuit represents just a half bridge connected to some kind of load. As mentioned before, I can turn it on and off very quickly, but the load still sees the voltage turning on and off. So for a CPU, you're still going to turn it on 12 volts bang. What a buck converter does is it adds an output filter to this half bridge to smooth out that on and off into more of an up and down. So let's add an output filter and see what happens. And would you look at that? This is starting to look a bit like a buck converter with a cylindrical electrolytic capacitor here to smooth out our output voltage from the half bridge. And as you can see it works quite nicely. Turn it on, turn it off, and you can see how the LED now slowly turns on and slowly turns off. So you can probably imagine if I flick this quickly the LED is not going to go off, it's just going to sort of ripple. There we go. Now let's see if we can measure that voltage with the multimeter. There we go, look at that. Can you see? It's about 3 volts, 4 volts. It's a little bit tricky for me to modulate the on to off ratio. But let's give it a go. So that's now off more. You can see it's more like 2.5 volts. And if I go off more, uh, on more, sorry, 6 volts. Amazing. And this whole process is known as pulse width modulation and is one of the absolute fundamentals of power electronics. Now you may be wondering, why is this capacitor that I used so much bigger than the ones on the motherboard? Well, there's two things that affect the size of capacitor needed. One of them is the amount of current running through the buck converter, so the higher the current, the bigger the capacitor needs to be to smooth out the voltage ripple. 
And the other thing is the switching frequency. So the faster that we can turn that switch between high and low, the smaller we need the capacitor to be because it has less time to fill in in order to smooth that ripple. Of course, I was switching very slowly, hence the need for such a large capacitor. Typical buck converters on a motherboard are going to be switching hundreds of thousands of times a second, hence why they can get away with much smaller capacitors, even though these are having to pump through tens, maybe even hundreds of watts, whereas my manual buck converter was only having to put through milliwatts to drive that little red LED. And that is why there is a constant strive in power electronics to switch faster, aided by advancements in semiconductor materials such as gallium nitride. So now that we know what a buck converter is and how it works, let's return to the star of the show, this beautiful multi-phase buck converter. What's the point? Why do we need more than one buck converter to drive the CPU? It's a common misconception that these are simply here to spread out the load, but if this was the case, it would be no different to just having one single large buck converter. And in the vast majority of cases, it's also not for any redundancy reasons, because if one phase fails, the others will reach such a high temperature because they have to take on the load of the broken phase that they will also inevitably fail. Now I'm afraid that to explain the need for multiple phases, we're going to have to do a little bit of theory. So I'm going to start by drawing our PWM signal, which is going to start low and then go high for a little bit and then stay low for a while. Now this isn't quite 8% duty cycle you'd expect for a CPU buck converter, but it's less than 50%, so I think it should illustrate the point. Next we're going to take a look at the output voltage from this converter. So whenever the output is high, our output voltage is going to be increasing. And then when the output is low, it's going to be decreasing. So I'm going to start here just to try and make things a bit easier. Output voltage is going to go up and then it's going to gently decrease down and then increase up, decrease down. Again, please excuse my drawing. This is very much not to scale, but it gets across the idea that our risers are steeper than our falls and that's because our duty cycle is less than 50%. And the key parameter for this voltage ripple is the difference between the trough, which is this low point, and the peak, which is this high point. And this is known as the peak to peak. And this peak to peak voltage typically has to be within tens of millivolts for a CPU, which is quite difficult to achieve. So right now, all of this is for a single phase buck converter. What happens if we add in a second phase? What does that even mean? Well, essentially, you just have a second buck converter, identical circuit, joined to this one at the input and output. But the bits in the middle that are doing the actual buck converting, they're separate. Now, because they're joined together, we'll want to run them at the same duty cycle. Otherwise, their output voltages will be mismatched and terrible things will happen. But there's no reason that we have to switch at the same time. And that's why they're known as phases. Because between this point and this point, the start and finish of a period, is 360 degrees of phase. And we can divide that 360 degrees up into however many phases we have. And what that will do is it will evenly distribute these pulses between all of our buck phases. So let's draw on a second phase, 180 degrees shifted from this first because we have two and that's half of 360. And now the individual voltage ripple of that converter, if it were to be disconnected from the previous, would just be the same as this, but again, 180 degrees shifted. So it would look a bit like this, but crucially, these two ripples get combined because our converters have their outputs joined together. And the resultant ripple looks something like this. And although it's drawn very poorly, hopefully you can see that this peak to peak is about half of that peak to peak meaning we've reduced our ripple, which is critical for applications like CPU power delivery. An interesting side effect is that we've also doubled our effective ripple frequency. So say we're switching here at 100 kilohertz, we would have a period between each of these pulses of 10 microseconds. But because we've also got these red pulses on our second phase, the distance between any two pulses is actually five microseconds meaning that the frequency of this ripple is actually 200 kilohertz, despite no single MOSFET having to switch any faster than 100 kilohertz. This higher effective switching frequency is another major advantage of a multi-phase buck converter, as it greatly improves the responsiveness to transients and changes in voltage demand. And of course, the more phases we add, the better our voltage ripple is going to become. Eh, hey, doesn't that look very pretty? Now, although this implies that the more power phases, the better, that's not necessarily the case. Component rating and quality still plays a big part, 
especially in longevity. And some products, especially those aimed at pro gamers, tend to employ some deceptive marketing. I've heard on the grapevine that often components will be doubled up and marketed as twice as many phases, when really they're controlled together and the actual number of electrical phases is less than quoted. Having said all that, I probably would steer away from as few as three phases on a modern system. This motherboard's fairly old now, but I thought it was a good choice for this video because firstly it's colourful and secondly, due to its age, the components used are large and easy to see. And many modern motherboards have heat sinks over their VRMs, as they're often called, which stands for voltage regulator modules. Due to their complexity, multi-phase buck converters aren't super common outside of computing applications where they're particularly suited to the very low duty cycle that's being run. Their relatively low cost also lends itself well to computers which generally have to pack a lot of complexity and technology into a relatively affordable package. One other application I'm aware of for multi-phase buck converters is in high power class D audio amplifiers where output ripple needs to be kept to an absolute minimum because otherwise it will manifest itself as audible noise. So that's it for my brief overview of multi-phase buck converters. I'm now going to do a bit more of a deep dive into the design choices of this specific motherboard. Though, don't feel you have to stick around if you're a gamer that just came for some quickfire knowledge. Please subscribe. So back at the motherboard, let's follow the path of the electricity, starting at the 4-pin CPU power connector, which has two 12-volt pins and two ground pins paralleled up to give about 12 amps, or 140 watts-ish. The positive supply then passes through this quite nice-looking inductor, which, due to the open-ended construction and small number of turns, I'd probably refer to more as a choke than an inductor. And the main purpose of this is to block high frequency switching noise from getting back into the wires, acting as an antenna, radiating out into things. So for EMC, electromagnetic compatibility, basically every product is required to not mess up other products. And this is part of that. After passing through this inductor, the positive rail then continues all the way over to here through a few fat traces. And it's stabilised by one, two, three, four large electrolytic capacitors that are rated at 16 volts, 1800 microfarads, giving a total capacitance of 7200 microfarads, which is quite a lot. Also connected to this positive rail is the high side MOSFETs. You can see each buck converter uses a paralleled pair of MOSFETs. We've got two here, two here, and two here for the three phases. The part number on these MOSFETs is K3918. And interestingly, the low side MOSFETs, which are this pair, this pair, and this pair, a K3919. So I had a quick look at the data sheet and it turns out that the 3919 is a higher current, lower on resistance variant of the 3918. So that's on the low side because the low side spends a longer time on with current flowing. I imagine it probably costs slightly more than the 3918, which is why they haven't used the superior MOSFET everywhere. And they can get away with the 3918 on the high side. The three inductors, one, two, three, are positioned in between the low side and high side MOSFETs. It's quite a nice layout on this board in general. And there's some quite nice shaped fills on here as well. So these two pins are the source connections of these two MOSFETs. This is the high side. And they're joined onto the tabs of the other two, which are the drain connections. And this whole thing is on a bit of a triangular shaped fill with vias presumably to a similar fill on the back or internally. And that's triangular so that it cuts across the inductor diagonally so that the other terminal of the inductor can have a nice solid connection into this big bank of capacitors, which is the output filtering. These capacitors are also 1,800 microfarads. They're smaller, however, because they're only 6.3 volts. And that gives a total of 12,600 microfarads feeding the CPU, which is pretty chunky. Now, I'm not an expert on CPUs, but I would assume this board is from 2006 and processors coming out around that time probably were operating at slightly higher voltage than modern CPUs. So you might be looking at more like 1.5 volts out of this multi-phase buck converter, which may be how they are able to get away with just three phases where most modern motherboards have more because they have to operate at a lower duty cycle. So flipping over to the back of the board gives a really nice view of the way it's all laid out. You can see here up at the top the four pin CPU power connector. These two pins are 12 volt and these two down here at ground. The 12 volts then comes up to here and passes through the fat inductor, which is these two chunky legs. And now we have the leads for one, two, three, four capacitors. And these little bits of solder that they've spread out on pads all over the chunky fills, they're just to add a little bit of resilience and thermal mass to try and prevent any fusing going on if there's a sudden inrush in current. For example, charging of the capacitors at startup. They're actually also located underneath the MOSFETs, at least quite a few are. So we've got one pair of MOSFETs here, here, and here, and they're the high side MOSFETs connected to this 12 volt plane. 
If we head back up to the 4-pin power connector, we can see that the ground must be on an internal layer because it wasn't visible on this side or the other side of the board. And it rears its head in a few places. We've got the negative connections of each of the four input capacitors. We've also got all the negative connections of the output capacitors. You can see how they've got a little circle around and they're connected to this internal ground plane through a few veers. It looks like four for each terminal of these output caps. We can also see the negative pop up here. So these are for the low side MOSFETs, which again have little solder pads above them. So there's a pair here, here and here. And we actually have a negative pop up all the way over here and the MOSFETs are getting their power through, it looks like maybe around 20 veers. And then here we have the connections for the output inductors. And you can see these triangular fills I was talking about. So the ones closer to the bottom of the screen are the outputs or switching nodes of the half bridges. They then pass through the inductor and all join together onto this enormous output fill. Power from the output fill will then pass to the CPU through a number of tracers and internal layers. So overall you can see it's fairly simple, it's fairly to the book. Apart from this input choke, there's nothing differentiating this from a circuit you just build up for fun. Up here underneath the CPU socket, you can see a lot of multi-layer ceramics used for decoupling. This is very common, and in fact you even find these on the CPU packages themselves, often on the backside in areas where pads or pins aren't present. As mentioned earlier, there are two other significant buck converters on this board. Not multi-phase, but still interesting to look at, especially as each one has a slightly different layout, despite using the same MOSFET package. Here is the one that's presumably for the RAM. We've got the two MOSFETs here. Here's the high side and here's the low side. The source of the high side passes up under the low side MOSFET and joins onto the drain tab of the low side MOSFET. This fill then continues to this small toroidal inductor and then to the two paralleled output capacitors. And here's the one I showed earlier. Again, two MOSFETs, high side and low side, input capacitor, output capacitor and filter inductor. And that's it. There's not really much else to say about this motherboard from a power standpoint. All the usual good practices have been followed, as you'd expect, because this power delivery section was probably designed by someone whose full-time job is to just design power delivery sections of motherboards. Right, well, that's it. I'd like to thank everybody for sticking around. I know it's been quite a while, but as you can see, I've got new lab, new house, new city, and even a new job at Red Bull Powertrains. I should have time now to make more videos for the foreseeable future, and I've got quite a lot of exciting things lined up, including taking a look at this teeny tiny gallium nitride power supply. But until then, thank you for watching, like and subscribe if you want to, comment if you want to, and goodbye.